Authentic is sponsored in whole by Voice of Prophecy. Maybe you've heard somebody say the Bible can't possibly be true because it's just a ripoff of much older and much more pagan documents. That's what we're going to look at on today's episode of Authentic. Welcome to Authentic. Sean Boonstra explores real existential questions about the meaning of your life and how you can live a genuine human existence. Listen every week right here on this station or on your favorite podcatcher. Here's Sean with this week's episode of Authentic. You know, there are all kinds of reasons somebody might question the claims of the Bible or the claims of Christianity, and some of those reasons are perfectly understandable. As one cheesy tabloid used to say, inquiring minds want to know. And if anybody is guilty of questioning just about everything, well, it's me. I'm not about to accept your claims at face value, and I expect that you would do the same. In fact, one of the reasons I do this show is because I'm convinced that the Bible holds up under scrutiny. So obviously, I can deal with honest questions, but what I don't waste my time on is dishonest questioning. And what do I mean by that? Well, I'm talking about the questions that obviously come with an agenda. The asker has already made up his or her mind about what they're going to believe, and there's really nothing I can say that's ever going to change that. In fact, it wouldn't even matter if an angel from heaven suddenly appeared to them. They're still not going to accept what it says in the Bible. There's a certain way of questioning that's really just a game of gotcha, like the questions the Pharisees asked Jesus in an attempt to embarrass him like this one that you find in John chapter 8, where the Pharisees take a woman they caught committing adultery and they threw her on the ground in front of Christ. Teacher, they say, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act, which kind of makes you wonder where the Pharisees happened to be when this was going on. Now Moses, they said, in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? It's really a disingenuous question because they couldn't care less about what happened to the woman. It was a trick question and they thought it had no good answer. If Jesus said they should exercise mercy and let her go, they could run to the Sanhedrin and say that Jesus of Nazareth is undermining the teachings of Moses. But on the other hand, if Jesus said, look, if the law says put her to death, then I mean put her to death, then they could run to the Romans and tell them that Jesus was making decisions about capital punishment. And that was something that the Roman government reserved to itself. So you can see, there was no good answer. And you probably know the rest of the story. Instead of taking the bait, Jesus bent down and started to write in the dirt. Now, the Bible doesn't explicitly tell us what he was writing, but the rest of the passage kind of gives it away. He who is without sin among you, he said, as he created some of his dirt doodles, let him throw a stone at her first. Now, we think he was writing, because he was God in human flesh, he was writing a list of the Pharisees' personal sins, their deep, dark secrets. So, what did Jesus do with disingenuous questions? He refused to answer them. And because I tend to use Jesus as a model for how I should conduct myself, I usually refuse to deal with disingenuous questions. I mean, if the questions are honest, if they're coming from somebody who's actually trying to understand, I'd probably be all over that, time permitting, because, well, I usually get more questions in a week than I can possibly answer. But if I suspect it's a game of gotcha, I'm not going to play, except for what we're going to talk about today, because unfortunately, some people have taken the work of disingenuous hucksters and believed it. So these are people who do have honest questions, even though they're questioning something they heard from a really unreliable source. And now I'm talking about this absurd idea that somehow early Christians borrowed their stories from ancient pagan sources. This idea that the gospel accounts found in the Bible are nothing more than a sloppy retelling of the Egyptian god Horus or the Persian god Mithras. It's a claim that falls apart really quickly once you start to actually examine it. But unfortunately, a lot of people just assume that the people teaching this nonsense know what they're talking about. Or worse, they believe this stuff because they saw a video on the internet. And a lot of people still subconsciously assume that if somebody went to the trouble of making a so-called documentary, well, there must be some truth to it. Look, I can tell you, there isn't. What these folks are doing is taking even the slightest parallel, the slightest similarity with pagan belief, and they make it seem very compelling by adding details 
they quite literally invented. And sometimes they'll throw in something that's actually true to make their claims seem a little more believable. For example, reputable scholars know that we really do have some pagan artifacts in our Christian religion that are cultural hangovers from the years when the pagan Roman Empire was transitioning to Christianity. The Emperor Constantine was the political catalyst for that transition, and from what we can tell, he adopted Christianity as the new state religion because he believed that Christians were so united they could serve as a kind of glue to hold his empire together. Constantine came to power at a time when the Roman Empire was anything but unified. And in the years leading up to his imperial takeover, he had worked with the emperor Diocletian, a man who ruthlessly persecuted Christians, especially during the decade between 313 and 323 AD. What Constantine noticed is that Christians can be really stubborn people, and most of them refused to change their beliefs even though they were being threatened with death. Maybe I could use that to my advantage, Constantine thought, to help unify this empire. And of course, his mother also happened to be a practicing Christian, and so Constantine adopted the faith of Christ. After conquering the city of Rome at the Battle of Milvian Bridge, he actually refused to offer the usual sacrifices to the pagan gods, and he even granted the Lateran Palace to the Roman bishop, who essentially had been living in a shack on the other side of the Tiber River. This was a really pivotal moment in the history of Western Christianity. But simply declaring the empire to be Christian doesn't magically make it so. Most of Constantine's subjects continued life with their pagan beliefs. And so in the decades and centuries that followed, all kinds of pagan customs slowly made their way into the church. Like December 25, the date we still use to celebrate the birth of Christ. We actually borrowed that date from pagan Roman festivals that were tied to the winter solstice. So. Some of these critics will use that history to prove their point. If we borrowed the 25th of December, they say, we probably borrowed everything else and Jesus is just a rehash of pagan mythology. This idea really dates back to the 19th century when higher criticism was coming into vogue. In some academic circles, there was this assumption that the story of the Bible, the way it appears in our modern English versions, was probably just a work of religious propaganda and couldn't be trusted. The scholar's default assumption was that the Bible isn't true, at least not entirely. So, for example, there was a lot of scoffing for a little while at the Bible's mention of this Near Eastern tribe known as the Hittites. There was no such thing, these people said, and so the Bible, obviously, was making them up. But then in 1880, a scholar by the name of Archibald Sace proved that some of the ruins uncovered during that century were absolutely the work of Hittites. They proved to be real. And it was roughly during this same historical period that a guy by the name of Gerald Massey suddenly proposed that the Egyptian god Horus was really the inspiration for the stories about Jesus. From the virgin birth to the resurrection, he said, it was all just ripped right out of ancient pagan mythology. And I'll be right back after this to explore that idea. Life can throw a lot at us. Sometimes we don't have all the answers. But that's where the Bible comes in. It's our guide to a more fulfilling life. Here at The Voice of Prophecy, we've created the Discover Bible Guides to be your guide to the Bible. They're designed to be simple, easy to use, and provide answers to many of life's toughest questions. And they're absolutely free. Sign up at BibleStudies.com today and start your journey of discovery. This is Authentic with Sean Boonstra and The Voice of Prophecy. A few years ago, the famous comedian Bill Maher released a movie called Religulous, a work quite literally designed to undermine religious faith. And at one point, you see him taunting a believer with this idea that Jesus is nothing more than a rebranded Horus. And it's an idea that he really took from the work of Gerald Massey. Written in 1280 BC, he says, the Book of the Dead describes a god, Horus. Horus is the son of the god Osiris, born to a virgin mother. He was baptized in a river by Anup, the baptizer, who was later beheaded. Like Jesus, Horus was tempted while alone in the desert, healed the sick, the blind, cast out demons, and walked on water. He raised Asar from the dead. Asar translates to Lazarus. 
Oh yeah, he also had 12 disciples. Yes, Horus was crucified first, and after three days, two women announced Horus, the savior of humanity, had been resurrected. Now, the problem with that is that it's absolute baloney. There is no book of the dead that describes the god Horus that way. To be sure, there is a book of the dead. In fact, there's more than one. But none of them tell that story. So either Bill Maher hasn't been doing his homework or he's being dishonest. His version of Horus is nothing but a fabrication. I mean, let's just unpack that story a little bit. Horus was the son of the Egyptian goddess Isis, who was, well, let's just say she was not a virgin. The real story is a little too salacious to repeat on this show. But let's just say that Isis was impregnated by her husband and he was dead at the time. So really the only similarity with Jesus is that Horus had an unusual origin. Secondly, there's absolutely no record of a character by the name of Anup the Baptizer anywhere. In fact, the first mention of this guy that I'm aware of is from Gerald Massey back in the 19th century, which makes me suspect he made the story up. Anup is a Coptic name for the Egyptian god Anubis, who never baptized anybody and he was never beheaded. The story is a complete lie. So, what about the claim that Horus was somehow tempted by the devil in the wilderness? Well, Egyptian records do tell us that Horus did battle with an Egyptian god known as Set, who was said to be the god of the wilderness. But there is no story of Horus being tempted by the devil. And we're talking about Horus having a tough time out in the desert. That's a far cry from the story you find in Matthew chapter 4. And I mean, come on, big deal. A desert story from Egypt? What a surprise! Furthermore, mythology tells us that Horus made peace with Set, which is the opposite of what happened between Jesus and the devil. Horus also never raised a man named Asar from the dead. He never had 12 disciples or any disciples that we know of. He never walked on water and he was never crucified. At best, we have a handful of pictures of Horus with his arms spread out, which is not the same thing as a crucifixion. It's just a guy with his arms spread out. It's a fabricated story. But a lot of people have been tempted to think that it's true for a number of reasons. First of all, they simply don't have the historical background to know the difference. And they don't have the time to sit in the library and check these claims out for themselves. Secondly, because the Bible tells the story of the Israelites coming out of Egypt, it seems plausible to some people that they might have taken some Egyptian religion along with them. Which, of course, in a small way they did. I mean, they actually built a golden calf in the style of an Egyptian god. But as you might remember, they were roundly condemned by God for doing that. So it seems highly unlikely that the Jews would admit to being punished for a golden calf, but then quietly write the rest of the Bible as a work of Egyptian idolatry. The whole concept doesn't make sense. But then there's a third reason that people might be tempted to believe this stuff, and that's a personal need to dismiss the claims of the Bible. Because if you read the Bible honestly, you quickly discover that it makes some claims on your life. It says that you and I are the work of a Creator, and as such He has some moral claims on this universe. So if what the Bible says is true, it means something, about the way you're going to choose to live your life. And after being exposed to what the Bible says, if you really don't like it, you're probably going to leap at any theory that proposes that the claims of the Bible are mere fiction. Now again, I'm not really addressing people who have honest questions, because there are honest questions about the Bible, and I have some myself. But right now what I'm driving at is people who want the Bible to be falsified for personal reasons. They're not really interested in an honest exploration. So, now let's move on to another claim. And that's this idea that the Jesus story we find in the Bible was stolen from the Roman cult of Mithras, which was really just a reworking of an ancient Persian mystery religion. This is probably one of the most popular versions of the pagan Jesus theory, and so it really merits a little bit of thought. There are a few points of similarity, but they're superficial. The Roman cult of Mithras was really popular from the 1st to the 4th centuries AD, in other words, after Christ, which makes it seem highly unlikely that the Christians actually borrowed their stories from this cult because, well, it's hard to plagiarize something that hasn't happened yet. 
In reality, it's more likely that the cult of Mithras borrowed some ideas from the Christians because they came later. But that doesn't stop some people from making the claim. Mithras, they say, was born to a virgin on the 25th of December. He also had 12 disciples, he performed miracles, he was dead for three days and then came back to life. So on the surface, it does seem like somebody was plagiarizing. And the skeptics love to say it was the Christians. They just stole the story of Mithras wholesale. But the problem with this theory is it's not true. There is no record of Mithras being born on the 25th of December. And even if there was, that wouldn't mean much because he's a pagan deity. And there's just no question that December 25 was a significant date in the pagan world. The Bible never says Jesus was born on that day. And most Christians are perfectly aware that we borrowed that date from the pagans of Rome. It was a celebration of the return of the sun god, once the days started getting longer again after the winter solstice. But the only connection we even have with that concept is the story that Mithras was a friend of the sun god. Was Mithras born to a virgin? No, absolutely not. Ancient pagan artworks show him being born from a rock with a sword in his hand. There's also no record of Mithras having 12 disciples, although I've been given to understand that we have found one image of Mithras surrounded by the 12 signs of the zodiac. But the only thing that has in common with the biblical story is the number 12. That's a bit of a stretch. I mean, give me a break. Taurus, Leo, and Scorpio are not Peter, James, and John. And this idea that Mithras died and was resurrected on the third day, go look for it. It's a story that doesn't exist anywhere. And so it goes with all the other comparisons. There are people who say that Jesus is just a retelling of the Hindu god Krishna. But about the only thing that Krishna and Jesus have in common is the vague similarity between the words Krishna and Christ. Other people say that the story of Jesus is just a retelling of the Phrygian god Attis, and others say he's just Dionysus. But under even basic scrutiny, all these stories fall apart. They're nothing more than wishful thinking. Listen, across all cultures and all times, there are lots of ideas and experiences that are common to everybody, like the problem of suffering and death or the meaning of life. All of us hurt. All of us weep. And we all experience fear. Once upon a time, most of us had to figure out where our food was going to come from every single day. And if you had a bad harvest, it meant that people were going to starve to death. So really, is it a mystery that so many stories from so many cultures dwell on those themes? Absolutely not. It's exactly what you would expect. I'll be right back after this. Here at The Voice of Prophecy, we're committed to creating top quality programming for the whole family, like our audio adventure series, Discovery Mountain. Discovery Mountain is a Bible-based program for kids of all ages. Your whole family will enjoy the faith-building stories from this small mountain summer camp and town. With 24 seasonal episodes every year and fresh content every week, there's always a new adventure just on the horizon. Check it out today at discoverymountain.com. This is Authentic with Sean Boonstra and the Voice of Prophecy. You know, sometimes I really struggle to understand why anybody would want the story of Jesus to be untrue. I mean, we've already touched on the idea that if God is real, it makes us accountable to Him. But I think that's only part of the picture. Paganism and Christianity existed side by side in a really uneasy relationship for a really long time in Western Europe. In fact, judging by some accounts, that coexistence between pagans and Christians may still be happening, at least in places like Iceland, where construction on the country's first pagan temple in a thousand years has been underway now since 2017. And you know, it's actually in Scandinavian culture that we find a really good example as to why some people today find themselves wishing that Christianity would just go away. Go back about a thousand years to the golden age of the Vikings and you'll find Norwegian kings doing something that had been going on for centuries in the Germanic countries further to the south. Some of these kings attempted to force their subjects to become Christian. There were a number of Viking kings who lived in England growing up because there was a massive Viking settlement there. And some of them adopted Christian beliefs early because, well, England was largely Christian. Take, for example, a Christian king known as Olaf Tryggvason, 
who came to power in AD 995 after being raised in England. As was customary, the pagans living at Trondheim invited him to participate in a heathen festival traditionally attended by every king. When he arrived, however, he told the gathering of pagans that he wanted to go inside their pagan temple, which raised some eyebrows because they knew the king was Christian. I just want to go inside and see how you sacrifice, he said. So he went inside the temple with some of his men, and to the horror of the people standing outside, they could hear him smashing their idols. When the king came out, he had the leader of the local pagans executed in front of everybody, and then he gave the pagans two choices. Either convert to Christianity or fight the king and his army. It was conversion by force, and he was hardly the only Norwegian king to do something like that. In reality, the Vikings were probably somewhat open to examining the claims of Christ. But if there was one thing they were not open to, it was being forced. They were far too independent, far too strong-willed to have somebody coerce them into anything. So while they really didn't have a choice, their so-called conversion was not heartfelt. And when Olaf Tryggvason died, they all went back to observing their pagan rituals. And sadly, that's the story of Christianity across much of Western Europe, and it really started in the days of Constantine. In fact, there's an old story about Constantine marching his army through the Tiber River and then declaring them all baptized Christians. After the conversion of the Frankish kings, and especially after the rise of Charlemagne, or Charles the Great, we suddenly had French armies converting barbarian tribes at the point of a sword. After the Spanish Inquisition was launched in the early 13th century, it became very dangerous to hold what the official church considered to be heretical views. The Jews who lived in Spain were faced with a really difficult choice, convert to Christianity or face extreme punishment up to and including the death penalty. And I guess the reason I'm telling these stories is because I think it has a lot to do with why people want to dismiss the claims of the Bible. To their way of thinking, the religion of this book is some kind of moral monstrosity. It's a religion of force. And if Christians were perfectly honest about this, we'd have to admit they kind of have a point, historically speaking. In direct opposition to the teachings of Christ, we use the Bible to justify political power grabs, wars, and the utterly brutal treatment of people who didn't live or think like us. It's a phenomenon that continues to this day, to the point where you can see well-meaning Christians attempting to pass legislation that favors their beliefs, or even makes them compulsory for everybody else. And if there's one thing I've learned over the five and a half decades that I've been alive on this planet, it's that people do not like being forced. In fact, our natural reaction is to push back. So while it's certainly not the whole picture, I'm convinced it's part of why so many people work so hard to get rid of Christianity. It's because Christians have distorted the teachings of Christ and left a bad taste in just about everybody's mouth. We've created this situation where people do not hear God wooing them in the pages of the Bible. They assume the voice of God is forcing them. We've got nearly 2,000 years of really bad preaching, telling people that God is angry and vindictive and eager to destroy you if you don't toe the line. And that is an idea we did take from pagan mythology. I'll be right back after this. Dragons, beasts, cryptic statues. If you've ever read Daniel or Revelation and come away scratching your head, you're not alone. Voice of Prophecy's free Focus on Prophecy guides are designed to help you unlock the prophetic mysteries of the Bible and deepen your understanding of God's plan for you and the world around you. You can study online or request them by mail. Visit BibleStudies.com and start bringing prophecy into focus today. Welcome back. It's Authentic with Sean Boonstra and the Voice of Prophecy. At the close of the Bible, on the very last page, you find these important words. John writes, And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come. And let him who hears say, Come. And let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. Now you'll notice, it's not a threat, it's an invitation. 
there's just no question that a creator would have moral claims on his creation and that you and I would be accountable to that kind of God. That much is true, and it's a key part of why some people work so hard to dismiss the story of Jesus, including these dishonest people who push ridiculous conspiracy theories about a so-called heathen Christ borrowed from the archives of pagan mythology. Other people have pushed even more ridiculous theories like Eric Van Daniken, who suggested back in the 1960s that God was some kind of an alien astronaut who came to this world in a spaceship. And it seems to me that all of these ideas are nothing but escape mechanisms, deliberate attempts to evade the God of the Bible. And a lot of people want to dismiss the God of the Bible because they're convinced that He's some kind of really unpleasant God. And sometimes they tragically come to that conclusion because of our behavior, the Christians. And here's what I find so terribly unfortunate. If people would only take the time to read the Bible honestly, they'd find a God who defies almost all of our expectations. I mean, yes, He does call sin by its right name. And the human race really does have a very serious moral problem. The Bible doesn't sugarcoat the reality of our fallen nature and our broken relationship with God. It doesn't hold back when it tells us that we're guilty. But at the same time, we find this God of love, a God who is willing to risk everything, and I mean absolutely everything, to save us. You know, there's another thing that happens when you read this book, and I'm going to encourage you to give this a try. I mean, go ahead, read some pagan mythology. Immerse yourself in the stories of Olympus or Valhalla, and then come back and read the Gospels. Why? Because the idea that the story of Jesus was based on pagan myths is going to evaporate if you do this, because this book reads nothing like those ancient pagan myths. Even non-Christian scholars, and I emphasize the word scholars, recognize that Jesus is an historical reality. He actually lived, and there's no getting around the fact that He was the most remarkable human who ever walked the face of the earth. In other words, there's no rejecting Jesus on historical grounds, the way that Gerald Massey and his disciples would have you think. You can only reject Christ on the basis of philosophy. And even that becomes difficult if you're honest with what the Bible actually says. And let's be honest. If Jesus was just another retelling of pagan mythology, then why did the pagans of Western Europe have so much trouble adopting Christianity? If it was practically the same, that wouldn't make sense. So maybe give the Bible another try, and we'll give you a hand if you want. Just go to BibleStudies.com and you'll find a free Bible course we just want you to have. And I think you'll find that the person of Jesus we find in the Bible is worlds apart from the heroes and gods of the pagans, and you'll quickly discover it's not this book telling lies about Jesus. That's the work of the conspiracy theorists. Thanks for joining me. I'm Sean Boonstra, and you've been watching Authentic. You've been listening to Authentic, sponsored by Voice of Prophecy. Remember, you can listen every week right here at the same time. And thank you. Authentic is funded by listeners just like you. You can support at voiceofprophecy.com. That's also where you can find all the episodes you missed or where you can listen again. That's voiceofprophecy.com.